headline will not be seen tonight in order to bring you the following CBS News Extra. Look like in South Vietnam's capital city of Saigon on Saturday morning. All night Friday, the guns of the revolutionary forces had been firing on the loyal government troops and their installations. All night, the shells had fallen on or near the presidential palace, where President No Dinh Diem and his advisor brother No Dinh Nhu refused to surrender. Snipers were everywhere. The city streets rang with the rapid explosion of mortar shells over a background of shouts and cries. Tank guns were firing and submachine guns. The revolutionary forces had clearly moved according to a well-constructed plan, and they carried it out with skill, sealing off sections of the noisy, smoking city and neutralizing the government forces neighborhood by neighborhood. It was planned with intelligence. That would be a soldier's view. But even among soldiers, the battle broke down into little pieces and became a man with a gun guarding a man who had had a gun but now knelt on the sidewalk of a street with his arms tied with a rope. This is a CBS News Extra. Death of a Regime. The Vietnam Coup. Produced by and under the control of CBS News and presented as a public service by the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. The company which provides insurance protection for over 44 million people and by Metropolitan representatives in your community. This program comes to you in the belief it is important for all of us to see major news in the making and to know and understand the great events of our time. Good evening. Latest word this evening from our correspondent Peter Kalischer in Saigon is that army units loyal to the late President No Den Diem may still pose some threat to the military rebels who ousted Diem's government on Saturday morning. The rebels have pledged democracy and a decisive war against communism. A caretaker cabinet is being formed, reportedly under Nguyen Nok To as premier. He's a Buddhist who served as vice president under Diem. Before we show you this film of the fighting in Saigon, a word about how it got here. Our CBS News staff in Saigon, in a breakneck operation, got the film on a flight to Bangkok. There it caught Pan American's round the world jet to Tehran, where it was transshipped to a more direct flight. An accident that the Paris airport delayed that plane, and so we're set up now to transmit the pictures direct from Idlewild Airport. At the moment, the anti-aircraft batteries and machine gun batteries all around town are opening up, but from here you can't tell on what. All American personnel have been ordered off the streets, and uh, here at the embassy, reports are trickling in very slowly, Saturday in Saigon. The battle for the city went on for 18 hours, and most of it was centered on the presidential palace, where two men stubbornly held out until the end. This is the palace. Now there is a lull in the fighting. Just after 6.30 in the morning, Saturday, Saigon time, a white flag fluttered out a window of the presidential palace and the shooting ceased. Outside, the tanks were gathered. Then the Marines went in. These are Marines, the men who were in the forefront of the battle on the revolutionary side.
moving through a door that obviously is strong and obviously was meant for defense. That's the white flag, a Marine in scorn, waving it out the window. Like sightseers, these young men in battle dress, camouflage uniforms, walk through the rooms of the palace. First looking, and then taking. No one has said officially what happened to the two men who held out there so long, President Jim and his brother and advisor. The story in Saigon is that they escaped from this palace through a tunnel, perhaps dressed as Catholic priests, and then were seized by soldiers three hours later in a Catholic church. President Diem killed by gunfire, his brother killed by stabbing. That is the unofficial version. Our reporter at Idlewild Airport, from whence these newly arrived films were projected, was Robert Trout. The story of the Vietnam crisis, a look at the characters and the events that led to revolution. I'll be back with that part of the story after this word from Metropolitan Life. Vietnam became the American key to the security of Southeast Asia soon after the end of French colonial rule there in 1954. The country was split in half at the 17th parallel. The North fell under communist rule. The South was turned free. Since then, the story of South Vietnam has been the story of this man, Ngo Den Diem, the son of a noble Mandarin family that turned Roman Catholic back in the 17th century. Diem came to power in 1955. His country had been split in two a year earlier, and with a multi-billion dollar U.S. aid program, Diem built a powerful army as a bulwark against the communist guerrillas in the North. But trouble also came from within. February 27, 1962, rebel elements in Diem's own American-equipped air force attacked the palace in Saigon. It was unsuccessful, and the ruling family passed it off as isolated treason. Others said the revolt was widespread. President Diem took no chances. He moved into a new palace, guarded by his own private army. But certain conditions could not change. Roman Catholic Diem ruled a country that was two-third Buddhist. He considered opposition and treason synonymous. Diem gave favored treatment to Catholic institutions, and when the Buddhists demanded equality, they were met by strong-arm tactics. The responsibility for Buddhist repression fell to the man behind Saigon's political throne, Diem's brother, Ngo Den Nu. Nu stayed behind the scenes until his death, and had it not been for his fiery, outspoken wife, Madame Nu, Diem's brother might have permanently hidden himself in the background of palace politics. Since May of 1962, when Buddhist opposition broke into the open, Nu had the job of suppressing it. American involvement in Vietnam has been constant and costly since the French were pushed out. At least 61 American lives have been lost in battle with the communist Viet Cong. 16,500 American troops are in Vietnam now, ostensibly training and advising the native army, but often as not, getting into the thick of the anti-guerrilla war. Two and one half billion dollars in American aid have been poured into Vietnam thus far, aid that's now running at the rate of half a billion dollars annually. The war is a slow slogging process through rice paddies and jungle that are friends to the guerrilla fighters. A struggle of another sort was born in the Buddhist temples of Vietnam. The country's religious majority claimed oppression by the Catholic minority. They chose a violent and grisly form of protest. Suicide by fire. A flaming death that effectively brought the world to attention. This awesome scene was repeated time and again, but it made no impression on the government, least of all Madame Nu. She gave her blunt reaction to CBS News correspondent Peter Kalischer in Saigon. What have the Buddhist leaders done comparatively? The only thing they have done, they have uh, barbecued one of their monks uh, whom they have intoxicated, whom they have abused the confidence, 
and even that barbecuing was done um, not even with self-sufficient means because they, they used uh, imported uh, gasoline. There was reaction from the Dien government, August 21st, 1963. Noden News elite special forces raided Zaloi Pagoda and other Buddhist temples. 500 monks and nuns were arrested. In Washington, President Kennedy had reacted to previous excesses by sending Republican Henry Cabot Lodge as his new ambassador to Saigon. The change helped ensure bipartisan support for the administration's policy in Vietnam, a policy that turned tough on the Diem regime, but even a cut in U.S. aid did not create any observable change. Repression, arrests, harassment, if anything, increased. Students joined the Buddhist protest and were arrested just as quickly. The Diem regime charged that the Buddhists had joined the Communist Alliance to overthrow the government. Others argued that the monks were expressing widespread unrest and dissatisfaction with Diem's autocratic rule and the failure of his economic policy. The domestic revolt was a potent threat to the war against the Viet Cong. Washington became increasingly concerned that the religious issue would jeopardize new anti-communist military campaigns. The beginning of the end came with a grave warning from President Kennedy in this interview with Walter Cronkite. I don't think that uh, unless a greater effort is made by the government to win popular support, they, that the war can be won out there. In the final analysis, it's their war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it. We can help them. We can give them equipment. We can send our men out there as advisors, but they have to win it, the people of Vietnam, against the communists. We're prepared to continue to assist them. But I don't think that the war can be won unless the people support the effort. And in my opinion, in the last two months, the government has gotten out of touch with the people. The repressions against the Buddhists, uh, we felt, were very unwise. Now, uh, all we can do is to make it very clear that we don't think this is the way to win. I, it's my hope that this will become increasingly obvious to the government, that they will take steps to try to bring back popular support for this very essential struggle. The president turned to selective cuts in American aid as a last-ditch effort to liberalize Diem's policy, but Diem's treasury was well padded, and even after we stopped payments to his private army, those troops continued their police activities in Saigon. They ignored American pleas to turn to the fight against the guerrillas. These are the last films of No Den Diem taken in Saigon last weekend. Here he reviewed part of the military power that U.S. dollars and Diem's own fiery spirit had built. But the president ruled the military with an iron hand, playing one commander off against another. In the resulting political intrigue, South Vietnam found a revolutionary leader, General Duong Van Minh, seen here in better days with the late Diem. He's known as Big Men to distinguish him from another South Vietnamese general, Little Men. Big Men was a welcome name to Americans. He's a proven anti-communist warrior. In fact, his success in the field brought him to such national prominence but President Diem, concerned that men might become a threat, removed the general from command. With that demotion, Diem, in effect, set up the circumstances that brought about his own downfall and death. Reaction from Madame New to the end of her family's rule. I'll have that story after this message from Metropolitan Life. At least one unreconstructed member of the old regime remains in our midst. Today, with the coup and her husband's death an irrevocable fact, Madame No Den Nu has remained in seclusion and in silence. But yesterday, when the picture from Saigon was still unclear, Madame Nu held a press conference in Beverly Hills. Her daughter was at her side. What is done, whatever is done against Vietnam will be felt in America, too. It is not enough to try to kill or subdue the duly elected leaders of a country just because one wants to transform that country into a satellite. To kill or to subdue is easy. But what will happen afterwards? Treason does not pay. And nobody can rule Vietnam, can rule Vietnam with just the money and puppets. We do not live alone. The whole world has its eyes on Vietnam and knows perfectly well what is going there, what is going on there. In spite of all the distortions, the blackouts, 
directed by that international communist propaganda network, which has become so strong. The Ngo only wanted to give to Vietnam its own identity, which cannot be the same as the one wanted by those few Americans. General Jiang Wang Min, the supposed leader of the coup, is highly praised in the American press. But is he supposed to rule the Americans or the Vietnamese? And all those who whom some of the Americans intend to settle and to tutor, for how long will they hold the power, if they ever hold the power? I repeat, and all those whom some of the Americans intend to settle and to tutor, for how long will they hold the power, if they ever hold the power? Today, knowing past doubt that her husband is dead, Madame Nu waited for word of the rest of her family in Saigon, her children ages 15, 11, and 4. This afternoon, word came from the United States Department of State, and Marvin Kalb reports from Washington. The State Department informed Madame Nu today that her children are safe and will soon be flown to Rome. Presumably, she will join them there. This was the administration's first public communication with the former First Lady of South Vietnam since her arrival in the United States a month ago. Since it comes after the killing of her husband and brother-in-law, President Diem, it seems motivated at least in part by a sense of guilt that the coup d'etat, which this administration encouraged but apparently did not engineer, had to end with violent death for the brothers rather than with banishment to a foreign land which would have been preferred. Tonight, U.S. officials deplore the killing, so they regretted they had happened. Regret, however, will not delay this country's recognition of a new government in South Vietnam. That is expected within the next few days, once a caretaker cabinet is formed, one led by the former vice president, Nguyen Ngoc Tho, but controlled by the army generals who now control most of the country. Ambassador Lodge conferred today in Saigon with two of those generals. A source here described their meeting as brief but satisfactory. The ambassador presumably received a tentative list of cabinet members, but this cannot be confirmed here, as well as assurances that the war against the communist guerrillas will be waged as effectively as possible. Though the ambassador did not say so, it is understood here that the American economic aid program to South Vietnam, suspended in part a few months ago, will soon be resumed. This is Marvin Kalb in Washington. The view from our capital, but what's the view like in Saigon itself? How did the city they used to call the Paris of the Orient, react to the end of the No Den Diem and austerity. We'll have some more of that late film just off the jet at Idlewild after this word from Metropolitan Life. It's over, it's over. A long nightmare is over. A criminal dream in which the United States too long pretended that a family regime like Diem's, a family tyranny, really represented the people of the country. These are the people, the students, the ordinary people of Saigon cheering the troops, giving them bread, giving them bananas. The gift of the people of Saigon to their liberators. These troops have been fighting all night. They're hungry, and the people know it. That was Peter Kalischer again in Saigon. And this is Robert Trout again at Idlewild Airport. All these scenes after the 18-hour battle was over, the aftermath of the revolutionary fighting in the capital city.
burnt out military vehicles, wreckage, barbed wire, a one-way do not enter sign in front of the presidential palace, twisted, the debris of war, even though a short battle. There are weapons to be collected and to be stacked now that the fighting is done. Buildings damaged by gunfire. And cars too. And men. The crowds are pleased though, and for a while the government let them run wild. Through the streets at first aimlessly, then dancing, dancing the Western dances that had been forbidden by Madame Nu, the tango and the twist in the streets of Saigon. That was a statue that was erected to three legendary sisters in South Vietnam's history. It was said to resemble Madame Nu, and it was torn down. Offices and homes that belonged to some government employees were set fire. This is not the wreckage of war, but the wreckage of the jubilant celebration afterward. Books are being burned. The bookstore was said to have been owned by the Archbishop, who was one of the brothers of the late President Diem, the Archbishop who is now in Rome. A small witness. part of the statue again. Finally, after many hours, the crowds are told by the troops to behave, to restore order, and to stop the general celebration. No one seems too concerned. Neither the crowds nor the troops. The city of Saigon, this is how it looked. When the battle was over, and the soldiers, smiling half-heartedly, tried to quiet the jubilant celebration that followed. This evening, voice circuits were reopened to Saigon, and correspondent Peter Kalisher said that he has now learned beyond a doubt that No Den Diem and his brother Nu were assassinated. They did not commit suicide as the rebels had claimed. Kalisher also reports some troops in the north may still be loyal to the Diem regime, posing a threat to the new government. But though there may still be soldiers loyal to the memory of Diem, Diem and his family are gone. They have walked a path beaten clear in the dust of history by other ruling families that tried to equate suppression with government. It is the path that brought a king and queen of France to the guillotine, a czar and czarina of all the Russias to a blank wall in a communist cellar. Yesterday it brought no den dien and no den nu to an armored car in Saigon. So beginning today, for good or ill, new men will write the history of South Vietnam. This is Douglas Edwards. Good night.